Welcome to the South Carolina Medical Association's Patient-Centered Medical Home Webinars. This is the November 2015 webinar, and over the last several months, we have been discussing specifically what an NCQA patient-centered medical home is, but what we thought would be helpful would be to do a series on more basic introductory materials that you can view for a refresher about concepts related to the patient-centered medical home or that you can share with your staff or use in training for physicians, front office, referral coordinators, clinical coordinators, nurses, whatever staff that you have, we hope that these will be helpful. They're designed to be short, to be able to be viewed during a lunch hour with time for discussion. And we certainly welcome your feedback or requests for certain topics. At this point, we're going to do an introduction to the patient center medical home. And then we're also going to have a population health and a care management and likely a quality improvement seminar. So stay tuned for those. But this seminar is focused on the patient center medical home basics. And this is Scott Holtstrand. I'm the PCMH project director for the South Carolina Medical Association. So let's go ahead and get started. What is a patient centered medical home? In essence, you can divide a patient centered medical home into five distinct categories. If you look at this pie chart, you can see the five categories that you can use to define a patient centered medical home. The source for these five categories is ARHQ, which is a government agency that focuses on a number of things, including quality measures and qu improving quality care and primary care. But number one is it is a patient-centered concept. That's no surprise since that's in the very name. But for those of us who have been around the provider community for a while, we know that oftentimes the way that we provide care is truly not patient-centered in all respects. So what a patient-centered medical home does is it refocuses the attention on the patient and it requires us to ask the question for each aspect of the way that we provide care. Are we thinking it, about it through the eyes of the patient? Are we providing care with the patient in mind? And it may be that you go through these questions and determine, yes, we are, but it's a helpful exercise nonetheless. Going around the pie chart, it also involves coordinated care. A patient-centered medical home is, is interested in what happens when patients are not in the office. How are we coordinating the care for our patients discharged from the hospital, entering into a nursing home, seeing other specialists? And then continuing on, accessible services. In this era of healthcare, access is so vital, and what a patient-centered medical home does is it places a premium on access, whether that be extended hours, weekend hours, uh, easier access over the phone or via a patient portal or different types of innovative group visits or other types of encounters that encourage patients to have access to you. And then quality and safety are, ha are hallmarks of a patient-centered medical home. A patient-centered medical home is concerned about providing the best care, but not the best care in concept, but the best care that can be quantified with measurable uh, reporting and data. And certainly safety being a high priority as well, and safety that can be proven with quantitative results. And then finally, comprehensive care. A patient-centered medical home should be concerned about all aspects of a patient's care, not just the acute need or the chronic condition that is before you. And so it is concerned about behavioral health, about the whole spectrum of care from birth to death, and invol involving yourself in the totality of the patient's care, whatever that may be. So that's a, a very brief but overall definition of the five central tenets of a patient-centered medical home. So let's take a deeper dive into each of those concepts, starting with comprehensive care. And like I said earlier, it is care that is concerned about a patient's life from birth to death and all that may happen to a patient uh, during their lifetime. It also involves preventive care. It's not looking just to help patients when they get sick, but it's designed to assist patients before they get sick. And a, a lot of that will involve reaching out to patients who may not really believe they need preventative care. 
And so that's important for a patient-centered medical home. Chronic care is also a big part of a patient-centered medical home. We want to make sure that our chronically ill patients are receiving the, t the, care that we, um, the care that they deserve, which oftentimes results in us, again, needing to reach out to patients to remind them of uh, medication protocols or of needed services. Uh, you can think of a diabetic, for example, needing to come in every three months for an HbA1c measurement, um, microalbumin measurements, foot exams, eye exams. Basically, you're following evidence-based guidelines for the best care for chronic patients. Mental health is another large part of comprehensive care. We want to not just take care of the body, but the mind being a very important part of the body is also something that a patient-centered medical home focuses on. And so you're providing mental health care um, in your uh, practice, but you're also considering how to partner with community resources and others to assist with the mental health and behavioral health issues that your patients are facing. And then finally, the comprehensive care that is being provided takes a team. It, one person cannot provide the level of care that I've just described because it takes too much time, effort, and coordination to do so. And so it does require a team approach. And we believe that a physician-led team is the best team approach uh, because the physician being the uh, really the, the core of the healthcare system is able to provide excellent leadership in terms of the best approaches and the safest and highest quality ways to provide the kind of care that patients deserve. But the physicians uh, also engage their teammates and their coworkers and enable those uh, to uh, provide the highest level of care that they can to, enable, to allow the physician to focus on the most difficult uh, conditions and patients that present themselves to your practice. And then the second concept being patient-centered. You know, one aspect of a patient-centered medical home is that we start paying attention to uh, the differences in care for different races or different uh, ethnicities, uh, being sensitive to uh, the patients and their concerns that may arise uh, based on um, their background. And what a patient-centered focus does is it, it doesn't look at every patient the same. It really looks at each individual patient and discerns how can we best serve this part of our patient community. It also involves letting family and other caregivers play a role in the care for the patient. Again, like we talked about earlier, the team approach involves more than just your clinic. It involves the family and other caregivers who are going to be playing a role in assisting patients with uh, monitoring and improving on their conditions. A patient-centered medical home is also sensitive to various languages that may present themselves and has the capacity to uh, provide care and um, uh, address patients who may not speak English as their first language. Patient preferences are also a big part of a patient-centered medical home. We want to involve patients in shared decision-making where, where it is appropriate and involve the patient in their own care plans so that they can uh, take more ownership of the care uh, that you're prescribing for them. And then finally, alongside of that is the self-management. So we want the patient-centered care to enable the patients to provide the best care for themselves that they can when they're not with you. And so a patient-centered medical home enables patients and provides tools and resources for patients to be able to uh, provide better self-management of their own care. The next is coordinated care, and this involves the physician practice reaching out to patients, reaching out to specialists and hospitals, reaching outside of their four walls to make sure that when the patient is not with them, but in other systems of care or, other, uh, or with other providers, that you are monitoring that and getting reports on that because the primary care model involves the primary care physician being effectively the quarterback for the care of the patient, being aware of all the things that are going on so that the best diagnoses, uh, care treatment regimens, and uh, medication monitoring can be achieved. And so, like I said earlier, there are many places where a patient receives care and 
it is ideal for a patient-centered medical home to be aware of all of these and be in constant coordination and communication with these other areas because this coordination of care is, is better for the patients in terms of the safety for medication reconciliation. It also can help keep patients out of the hospital and from presenting to the emergency department. Transitions of care are a very important time for care coordination as they're transitioning out of the hospital into a nursing home or into their homes. We want to make sure that the patients understand what is expected of them and perform adequate follow-up to make sure the patients are, um, are, being, are, are remaining stable and doing what they need to do to stay out of the hospital. Certainly paying attention to labs that you order and make sure that you get labs back and reporting those labs to patients in a timely manner is important. And also imaging, making sure that any imaging studies that you order are followed up on to make sure you receive the image and then appropriate care is provided following receipt of it. And then access, very, very important. A patient-centered medical home focuses on, on access in a number of ways, one of which is providing same-day appointments for your patients so that when your patients have a need that day, they can get to you that day and not just work-ins, which are appropriate, but even reserved same-day appointments so that patients can have access to you. Uh, office hours is, of course, we've talked about this briefly, but having access when patients uh, can get to you. A lot of patients can't get to you from nine to five. And so some you need to consider ways as a patient center medical home to serve your patients, whether it's you or making services available to your patients after hours. My chart is an example of a portal. I believe that's Epic's program uses my chart, but whatever patient uh, EMR you're using, uh, having patients being able to access you on a patient portal is another way that you can be accessible to them. And also you can post results from tests and allow patients to schedule appointments and ask questions when they're not with you. Patient wait times is another thing. If a patient thinks they're going to need to wait two or three hours to see you, you know, you're going to lose some of these patients. They're going to go to other places, which fractures the care that we're trying to provide. So wait times is a very important piece of access. Phone access is another thing. Uh, Patients need to be able to contact you within reason, of course, but um, when they have clinical questions that don't require uh, coming in person, there should be protocols and triage uh, processes in place so that patients can receive uh, that kind of care. And then you can reserve your time for patients that really need to be seen in person. This is another concept. Uh, Medicare is pushing this in their chronic care management code where they want physicians to be accessible 24-7, 365. And that's asking a lot, and there are ways that you can structure this so it doesn't overwhelm you. But this is becoming uh, the norm, particularly if you want to qualify for some of the new revenue streams that are available through Medicare, and we think eventually through commercial payers. Quality and safety is another thing. Uh, population health is a very important part of quality. We want to not just take care of each individual patient, which of course we do. We also want to manage our populations and make sure that we are providing the type of care that has been shown to be effective for managing your chronic care populations um, and others. Quality improvement. This is the Plan, Do, Study, Act, PDSA cycle of quality improvement uh, exhibited here. Patient-centered medical homes are focused on always improving, uh, to measuring themselves, and trying to improve on those measures. So here's some examples of some clinical quality measures and what those might look like. And if you're not measuring yourself in a quantitative way, then it's gonna be very difficult for you to know truly how well you're doing for the care of your patient. And we all know that quantitative data and um, patient care is not uh, where we want it to be, but it's certainly being used by payers and by hospital systems even now. And so our commitment is to continually improve the way that we measure providers so that we can eventually get to a measurement method that is fair, equitable, but also uh, drives the type of performance and quality and safety that we're looking for. Uh, certainly patient satisfaction is a big part of quality and safety. This is a, another way that many physicians are being measured even now. Uh, the CAPS survey is one of the more famous ones. Press Ganey might be another one that you've heard of, where patient satisfaction is a measure of the quality that you're providing. Also, uh, providing evidence-based care. Uh, more and more, 
uh, payers and other providers are becoming held accountable for making sure that for diabetics or for hypertensives or for acute care or for any type of care you're providing, that you're doing so in a way that is in line with uh, the best research that is out there showing um, the best results for outcomes. Of course, uh, we know that the practice of medicine, there is an art involved as well and each patient is different, but when possible, we encourage the um, following evidence-based guidelines and also the continued development of evidence-based guidelines uh, to ensure that we are using the best medicine that we can. And then using clinical decision support in your EMR. For those of you who have EMR, uh, implementing point-of-care clinical decision support can be very helpful. Uh, there's a lot that you have to know and remember, and so it's all, it can be helpful. You don't want to overwhelm yourself with it so much that you just start avoiding it because it's just too much. But you want to pick certain areas that you really want to focus on and implement clinical decision support into your EMR. So I know this was a very brief overview of what a patient-centered medical home is and does. Uh, there's a lot of these concepts that we could take hours on each of them, and, and we likely will delve more deeply into each of these topics over time. But what we hope this does is it gives you just a very brief overall introduction uh, to what a patient-centered medical home is and what is expected. Uh, there are some things that we've talked about today that are, are very controversial even now. Um, how physicians are being measured quantitatively, uh, having access to patients, um, opening your doors after hours. I mean, there's things in here that are very difficult and hard to do. And what we are committed to at the Medical Association is helping you through any of these issues, uh, both to survive and to thrive in the midst of the change that we're seeing. So please stay tuned for our next webinar, which is going to be on population health.